this particular blank here it was kind of roughed out for a very utilitarian um, narrow shaped whistle and you can work within the confines of these uh, parameters on these on this block here now if I was uh, gonna be making something a little more elaborate like a full sculpted face uh, well then I would start off and I would you know same principle you have your two pieces of wood but I would I would rough them out uh, and leave more room to accommodate my design but it's the same principle they're gonna be split open and be able to be put back together and at that point um, you really need to shape uh, the whole outside of your whistle and you really need to plan ahead for where the sound uh, chamber is going to be and where the sound is going to come out of. So um, the one thing about these whistles is that if, if you move the, the sound um, chamber a long ways away from where you're blowing into, it's going to take a lot more air and you might not have the capacity to hollow out as much in the whistle to make a deeper sound so you have to put some forethought into uh, where the sound chamber is going to be um, and so for instance on this one here I had the idea um, for the sound to be coming out of the mouth and so I was very um, careful about where I took wood away um, so I could place this where it needed to be so that's a main one of the main factors in designing your whistles is um, it all has to sort of be designed around where is the sound going to come from. So there's infinite possibilities, but that, that has to be pretty well thought out. So if I was going to be designing for the sound to come out of a mouth like this, I have to leave enough room So this, this is kind of a roughed out blank. And if I was gonna be designing my mouth here and cutting down an area here on the handle and then making it smaller for a mouthpiece, on the inside, you know, I have a center line and on the other piece, I'll have a center line because I have to create an air passage that comes up through the handle and then if the mouth is going to be here, I have to make sure that I measure very carefully on this piece of wood and on this piece of wood where that area is that's going to split the, the wind going through to make the noise. So I will have my center lines and then I will draw a couple little marks leading right up to the area where the, the air is going to have to make a choice and go up out of the whistle or down into the whistle. This here is a little example um, of how how the inside chambers can look. So this particular whistle here has one chamber and this particular whistle has three chambers but they're all really identical so when you blow in there's a little slotted passage here where the wind goes in and each one of these has been carved from the other side down to a little thin piece of wood you know almost razor blade thin and then when it closes up like this you'll see that they, that they match up. So when you blow through, the air comes down and it hits that little thin piece of cedar. And when it does that, it hits and part of the air goes down and part of the air goes up and out. And then you see these, um, I call them air volume chambers. Um, that's where the air that comes in will then go down into these chambers. And by doing that, it creates a little bit lower of a pressure 
on the on the sound device and so it makes a lower noise the less volume you have inside the whistle the higher pitch the uh, the, the sound of the note that comes out um, and in some of the really big whistles that are really hollowed out it has a really low pitch but it takes a lot more air volume so you have to have a, a fairly larger lung capacity and this one when I was making it I got to the point where it made noise and then I blew through it and it was kind of higher pitched and so um, the first thing I did was I broadened the size of the the hole in here and, and made a little more surface area for the air to hit and that helped and then on the inside of the of the whistle I started um, hollowing away wood and I'd take a little bit of wood out close it back up and I would test it and the sound would get a little bit lower and a little bit lower and I finally came to a point on this particular whistle where I thought I like the sound I like the tone and um, at that point I quit removing wood on the inside so that it, the note would stay the same and another important factor is once you close up your whistle, um, you don't want air to be, you want the air to be focused on the thin piece of wood that's going to split it, and you don't want a lot of air leaking out around the outside. As, as soon as you start getting air leakage around the outside, it, it lowers the pressure and requires a lot more air um, to make the sound. So traditionally, things like um, tree sap, and pitch and some tars uh, were rubbed around the edge like a caulk and then it was uh, squeezed together tight and that would kind of harden up and cause you know no air leakage out and then sometimes they were wrapped with spruce root and things like that and maybe sewn on the sides when we're when we're measuring out you know we have to carefully plan out where the hole is going to be and the little thin piece of wood is going to be that splits the air. That's a really vital component of, of having the whistle make the proper sound. So, for instance, on this blank, I'm going to measure out for the mouth. And on the inside, I have a center line, and I really find it useful um, to have it, always have a center line so I have something to measure from. And on something like this, not only is there artistic expression, but there's also craftsmanship, and you have to get the craftsmanship right in order for it to work properly. So, um, so I will sketch out where exactly the air chamber is gonna, is gonna come through here and this part here will be the thin piece and the air will hit this and some of it will come into the whistle this direction and some of it will go out of the whistle this direction and, um, and when it does that that's what creates the sound so on the side that you would create the hole and the little piece of area that's going to split the air. The opposite side, what I'll do is I will take a measurement and I will find how far up the handle is, is my little air passage. And I'll take a measurement and you can do it with a ruler and this one is at uh, about four and three quarters. So on the opposing handle I'll make a mark about four and three quarters and then another important measurement is how wide is the opening of your of your hole going to be so and you really want to make sure that on this part here that you get it equal so that the air chamber really lines up you really want the air chamber to line up with this here, so... So 
So I'll make my marks. Okay, so what I've done is I've marked um, the two halves. Now this this side here, this is going to be, this is the back of the front side of the rattle, okay? So this is the side that the air is going to come out of. And we will cut the hole through here, but we will leave this part here perfectly flat. Um, and then this side here... I've marked out the dimensions of the air passage here where when we put them together and we blow through it the air is going to travel through this side here and it's going to come out right here and it's going to be able to hit this little opening and so a trick to this too is when you're cutting down into it is to take off a little bit of wood at a time and start cutting out the air passage here, which is just going to be a very shallow sixteenth of an inch um, opening here. And then I will I will turn it over, I'll put them together, and I will blow, and I'll see if it makes the proper sound. And I always like to take off less to begin with, and that way if I if the tone needs to be deeper, or I think, you know what, there's too much resistance, I need to take out a little more from the air passage. Well, then I will, I'll take my knives and I will cut down and I will take out a little more from the air passage, and I do it in small increments. Put them back together and then blow on it. And sometimes I find that maybe the opening here needs to be a little bit bigger, and if you get the opening with a little piece of wood, uh, the air hits it. If that's too far away from where the air comes in, uh, it might not make the sound properly. So I, I bring that back little bits at a time too, and then I keep putting it back together and testing them. Once I've decided um, where this is going to be, I then start from this front side. I will take my knives, I will cut down, and I will take a gouge or a hook knife, and I will start scooping down until I've gone um, all the way through this. So that's another, oops, another consideration is the thicker your top half of your whistle is going to be, the farther you're going to have to travel through the wood um, to get all the way to the to make an actual opening because you have to carve all the way through the wood so that's another consideration is that um, when I was making this one here initially it was starting off way up here and as I was starting to carve into it I thought you know that's a pretty excessive amount to, to have to carve through the wood and I thought the mouth opening was going to have to be much larger to accommodate getting tools in there so I went ahead and I angled the mouth down more and I brought it in more and as I did that um, it made a smaller area for me to have to carve through. And so this particular blank here I actually made even a little bit smaller um, because I had the benefit of, of making this one first and anything that I saw that I wished I had have done on that one I, I changed on this blank here so now I don't have to travel as far through. Um, it'll affect a little bit of the sculpture design, um, but that's okay. So I'll have a little less meat here for adding sculpture, but I'll have an easier time making the sound. One of the very important things about this uh, kind of an art piece is that you want it to look artistically very good, but you need it to work. So it has to really be, this is really form and function. Um, you need both. And one of the things about our old Northwest Coast whistles were sometimes elaborate decorations didn't matter. Um, they weren't going to be seen when they were used anyways. So 
the most important thing was the noise and the tonal quality. If that functioned like you wanted it to, then that was what you were after. You know, this one here is just a combination of artistic style and function. So, you know, I definitely want it to make the sound that you want it to make. And you want it to be pleasing to you. So people ask me what tone is it supposed to make? Well, I think that's kind of up to the maker. Uh, what what sound pleases you? And if it sounds good to you, then that's a good sound. So one of the big factors in the tone is how much um, airspace you take out inside of the whistle. So Air pressure is a direct relationship to the tone that your whistle is going to make. So once the air comes through here and comes out of the whistle, comes out of the whistle here, it also needs an area for the second half of the air to go inside of the whistle to relieve some pressure and the sound will kind of resonate through there. So when I was choosing the tone of the whistle I made, I started off with just a little bit of hollowing um, in the back of the head here and in this particular one it's hollowed mostly the whole back side and then if you wanted it to have more a more lower tone um, a deeper tone then you can also hollow out um, on the top When you close this up, now those, the air chamber in the top and the air chamber on the bottom kind of match up and it gives more mm -hmm. volume for the air to circulate around in there. And um, I could have certainly made this have a deeper tone. By doing that, sometimes though, it takes a lot more air volume. So you have to keep that in mind of, um, how long do you want to be able to, produ to produce a tone or a note? If you want to be able to hold a tone for quite a while, you need a little less um, capacity for the air to go and disappear, and you need a little more resistance. So if you blow through here and the area is so vast inside of the whistle that it just takes all of your breath and absorbs it, um, you'll get a very low tone, but your lung capacity won't really um, won't be able to hold out. Now, the air chamber on the side of the whistle where the air comes in, you can start your air chamber right at the top of where the air comes in. So now I've kind of drawn an area that I can now hollow out to create an air chamber. And the reason why before I do this part, I always get the outside um, all the way sculpted so I know how much room I have left. So it'd be tragic for me to start hollowing it out and then realize that now I don't have enough wood left uh, to create my sculpture. Now on this part of the whistle, you have to leave, you have to start the air chamber back from the, from the top of this a little bit. So the air is going to hit this and then it will immediately have a way to go down into the bottom. But you want to just get it back away from here so you leave a little thickness in here so we don't start getting too, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sturdy. You don't you don't want this to become fragile and be able to break. So you have from this side a very thin portion coming down, and then over here um, we just want to make sure that we leave a little bit of wood here so that we're not getting into any breakage issues. The air chamber usually on one side. On this side, the air chamber could be a substantial amount larger 
on this one since the mouth is going to be here then I might have this is coming into an ovoid which is kind of funny so now I'm going to have about this much room here so when these match up the air will be able to go through circulate down through here and up through that little portion and then that's really going to be what causes the um, the tone quality um, by directly decreasing uh, some of the pressure and if the pressure is too great and the air is going too fast it won't it won't make a sound and then if the pressure is too low the sound won't last for very long So now that I've determined the area that I would like to start hollowing out, um, I'm going to select the knife that I think best suits the purpose, and that will be this nice hook knife here. That's going to allow me to get in there and um, And then I will keep going uh, and hollowing it out until I've got the air chamber that I want. And, I, and that's the part where then I will start putting them back together and blowing on them. And once you start make, the whistle starts making noise, it's, um, you can notice a difference in the tone every time you take a few slices out. It's, it's really kind of fun that way so that's kind of that's kind of the part where you start hollowing some more out you think you know I, I don't think the whistle is making quite the tone I wanted to make so I'm gonna come back in here and I'm gonna start taking some more wood out <laughs> 